introduce? No, we don't have to introduce. To no, no, you can, you can. <laughs> <laughs> to present Deputy yeah. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Daniel Elon, you know, good friend, uh, and first of all, to thank him that he spared the time to come to sit with us now and also for lunchtime. So, with no further ado, please. The thank you. Thank you, Igal, and thank you very much for all of you to come here. Um, I think this is an exemplary uh, um, action here, which unites uh, government and NGOs in a very, very, very special mission to uh, defend Israel. And when we talk about defending Israel today, it's not just protecting our name, because uh, we see this uh, very, very dangerous um, tendency and the uh, slippery slope that uh, all our detractors are trying to take us. Uh, it may start with uh, BDS, right, the boycotts, divestments, uh, uh, sanctions uh, ideas, and of course, uh, bed cover, let alone trying to uh, define Israel as a war criminal, its leaders, its soldiers, its commanders as war criminals, and uh, pretty much to take us to this uh, very, very unwanted areas of uh, pariah states. They look at the uh, Kosovo or the Belgrade, the Serbia example. They look at the South Africa example. And uh, today they have a mission. And we have to understand, and when we talk about they, generically, it's uh, basically Palestinian motivated. And when I talk about Palestinians, it's not only Hamas. It's also, unfortunately, it's also, unfortunately, the, what we hope is our partner for peace. It's also the Palestinian Authority that uh, is very much dedicated to defame Israel and uh, to put an extreme pressure on Israel and compromise our uh, national standing and our national security. Today we know that uh, standing in the world, the political warfare, is uh, replacing actually the um, warfare on, on the battlefields. If uh, they try to take us on militarily and they couldn't, and then economically and they couldn't, and with terror and they couldn't, now the front is the, um, the political warfare and the legal warfare. And uh, we have to understand, first of all, identifying the problem that we are facing a very, very dedicated enemy who is also very sophisticated, who is also now uh, using uh, technology, Internet, Facebook, and many, many other things, using NGOs in a very, very sophisticated way and um, a large, large network. Once we identify that, that there is a dedicated campaign against us by, by a whole network, then we can group or regroup and uh, encounter it. And that the, my bottom line is that to counter it, to re-legitimate Israel or to fight delegitimization, we need also to have a network. And by network, it's not just the government, uh, not just in these issues of, uh, of public diplomacy or Hasbara, the government is not the most effective. There are many, many other issues, social issues, economic issues. I, I look, and, and now I just put a parenthesis here, I just deviate from the main uh, uh, subject that we are all here gathered for, but uh, I see that uh, in the 21st century, I see that the best way a society can take care of, of, of problems or tackle challenges is by a whole community, that is government, business sector and the third sector or the NGOs together. Uh, and I don't want to belabor too much about that, but this is, I mean, I've seen it in Aliyah, how NGOs in Aliyah can lead in a way of innovation, of uh, being agile, of, of dedication, and then the government follows suit. So in many cases, the government today should be in a supportive role in terms of maybe finances, in terms of uh, information, certainly in our case. But I can tell you here, uh, we cannot do it alone. The government cannot do it alone. The foreign ministry cannot do it alone. The embassies ab uh, abroad cannot do it alone. First of all, because there is an inherent uh, nature of bureaucracy, which is, uh, for good or bad, 
which is less agile than uh, other organizations. And secondly, because we are the, 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 the subject of discussion. So when an Israeli ambassador goes out and talks about, you know, attacking Israel, he's expected to say that. So the credibility or the, the let's say, the, the listening uh, or the attention scope may not be as effective as when someone else says it. Of course, for us, the best would be uh, a non-Israeli, uh, a non-Jew to say that. Uh, but uh, mm. I think that more effective than Israeli government officials are Israeli citizens, uh, Israeli NGOs who live, who are not, uh, let's say, being uh, suspected of having a political motivation. So this is why you are the elite force of Hasbara. You are actually uh, our force multiplier and probably the most effective in terms of Hasbara. I think our job in the ministry is to make sure that all the information is available to you. And this is what we're trying to do. Uh, but the rest must be, uh, must be yours. I can tell you that uh, also from the uh, innovation technological point of view, we're also trying to use the web. For instance, tonight, uh, I'm going to have a uh, webcast, a special uh, web interviews on a uh, live one, online of course, with uh, Facebook users all over the world, that uh, Eagle Caspi's and the Shacham and, and Eagle Caspi's uh, division uh, organized. Um, my chief of staff, David Siegel, which is here, who also was uh, a legendary spokesman of the Israeli embassy in Washington, also was the first one to arrange for me when I was in Washington an interview with a blogger. Uh, David, what was the name of it? Instapandit, yeah. And, and, and this was the first time an Israeli official went to interview with a blogger, and there were like, what, two and a half million hits or something like that, or, or participants. So we are trying, maybe not as, as quickly, but we are trying to, uh, to move ahead, try to be ahead of the curve, but it's very difficult, but at least to, to try and be and, and join you in, in the cutting edge. But, uh, we will discuss later also, of course, the practicality of, you know, synergy of, of how uh, uh, we better can, can work together as a network because it needs a, bet a network to be the network. And there is a network against us and we will have to have a network. Even it's not official, it's not hierarchical, uh, it's, but, but we have to understand, uh, all of us, uh, the, the mission and how important uh, it is. But uh, before that, uh, I think the message should be, and this is a critical message from a political standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, from a diplomatic standpoint, from a practical standpoint, is that two things. If delegitimizations will continue, it will be an obstacle to peace. Delegitimization is the enemy for peace. Why? For a very, uh, very simple reason. If uh, you try to paint Israel into the corner, there is no incentive whatsoever for the Palestinians to move forward and to negotiate. They believe, and they still do believe until this moment, the Palestinians, that somebody else will do the job for them. So this is what has to be understood by all those peaceniks, whomever, many of them, many of them have good uh, intentions. Not all of them are uh, very much versed with the situation. Many of them are, you know, uh, idealists that are being manipulated by those masterminds of delegitimizations, whether it's in Gaza or whether it's in uh, Ramallah and they're using, or whether it's in uh, other places in the Arab and the Muslim world, and they're using their hubs. London is a big hub. They're using uh, um, NGOs, uh, human rights organizations from the United States all over. And uh, so we will not be able to reason with those who try to, to, to fight us. But I think the word should go out and to reach every organization which is supposedly an objective one, whether it's Human Rights Watch, whether it's uh, other ones, whether it's the, the labor unions, 
what should labor unions, for crying out loud, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in London, have to do with the political uh, fight that we have here or, or, or with this real big uh, national struggle that we have here with the Palestinians or academia? It's important because not all of those professors, not all of those human rights activists actually know what they're doing. So first of all, of course, we have to, have, uh, to, to give them the, the information and, and the history and all that. But it's very difficult because today, in a very fast world of sound bites, it's very difficult in a sound bite to explain the, 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 the inherent right of the Jewish people to our land or that uh, actually it's the Palestinians or the Arabs who denied us peace now for generations. It's very, very difficult. So we'll have to find a way to do it, in a, whether it's in blogs or other ways. But at the same time, we will have to reach to those who are in the middle of the road or those who are being manipulated and telling them, first of all, what are the facts. We have to find a, a, some more, I think, more innovative ways to, to deliver our message in a concise way but in a, an effective way. And secondly, to tell them that they are being manipulated. And in effect, what they're doing is, if they're all idealists who want to see peace, actually they're pushing peace further away by defaming Israel. I think this should be uh, a, a main message. And secondly, what I see here is that the Palestinians, and by the way, it's not just in the issue of delegitimization. I, I can see it from day one. Day one, 1994, that's after the Oslo Agreement, Arafat, with 100,000 of his people, came here to build the Palestinian Authority which was an Israeli creation with the international community of the Palestinian Authority. And we see it, and we can prove it. Again, now we don't have the time, but we can have a whole dissertation about it. From day one that Arafat landed here, instead of being dedicated to building a Palestinian homeland or a Palestinian state, he is dedicated to destroying Israel. Instead of building a nation, they're dedicated to destroying a nation. And this also somehow has to be in a... In a impressive in a convincing way has to be delivered internationally. So I think this is our, our main challenges, all of us here. And, and we are here together. And we are here very much appreciative of what you're doing. And I, I want to stress again, what you're doing is much more effective than what we are doing. Because we are paid to do that. So it's much more impressive, it's much more um, convincing uh, when you're doing it. And as I said, it will take a whole community to do it. All of your organizations here, and I don't want to mention, I know all of you, and I appreciate very much all the organizations here and all the people here. It will take the ministries. It will take other organizations. So I think we'll have to kind of multiply it by others, whether it's uh, Christian organizations, whether uh, even, uh, I don't know if we know of any moderate Muslims, but uh, we'll have to use everything that, that we can in, in the media, in the web, in the academia, everywhere we can. So people will understand it, and, and uh, I think this will be our, uh, uh, our challenge for some time to come, but it's, it's an uphill battle, but I don't believe we should give it up because I believe we can win this battle. We can win this battle just that we, we mean we won battles that were at most odds against us in, in, in many other fronts. And here, I think uh, it's important, I think, to let you know about my meetings with um, the founder of Human Rights Watch. Uh, Rubinstein, was it, David? Bernstein. Bernstein. A very, very uh, impressive uh, fellow. Now he's like 86 years old, but he's sharp as a tack. And he told us about the whole human rights movement. What was the motivation to build it? If you remember, it was in the height of the Cold War. And the idea of human rights groups and human rights watch was twofold. First of all, was to investigate, to investigate closed societies, totalitarian societies, societies which do not have free press, which do not have, do not have free organizations and NGOs and free academia that can check themselves. This was the main thing. And secondly was to deal really with human rights issues, whether are minority issues or women empowerment 
or child abuses, things like that. What do they do today? They don't deal with that. They don't deal with closed societies. I don't see really human rights watch working in Saudi Arabia or Sudan or Cuba or Venezuela today or North Korea. They don't. So they have actually, are be they are betraying their, 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 their ideal of closed society, of bettering the life in this closed society. What are they checking now? The United States, Britain, Israel on supposedly war crimes. When Israel and the United States and other countries are very much equipped to investigate themselves. We have free press, nobody uh, uh, disappears here if he is critical. So this is one wrong by this human rights society today. And the second one is that they have put th themselves as judges or referees or whatever you want to say it in areas of conflict. They have no qualifications to judge areas of conflict. They have no military background, they have no military experience, they don't know the discipline, and in order to check an area of conflict, you don't come with the human right aspect. You come with military experts to do it, and also with legal experts of military background. These are two points that Mr. Bernstein told me which were really illuminating, which are, I think are very, very powerful. And I think this message also should be out to all those organizations which, again, I, uh, I don't want to, uh, to uh, let's say, a priori to suspect their motives, but maybe, as I said, they are being fooled. Maybe they are being manipulated. Some are not, I know. If Human Rights Watch today is being financed by Saudi Arabia, then there is a foul play there. But many others, maybe not. And those are the ones we need to reach. So again, my uh, uh, call to you is uh, be patient. It's a long ride. We will be there for you, and I know you will be there for us. And uh, the, the, uh, the solution is in this cooperation, as I said, that you know, we will, and we should continue to meet and find ways to, for better communication, for better message, for better delivery, for, and also to try to be ahead of the curve to understand what would be the next battle, because they are not going to stop. Unfortunately, as I said, unfortunately what I see here now, that the Palestinian leadership is not so much concerned about nation building as they are concerned about nation destroying. So they will continue to be very, very creative and innovative in attacking us in the political world, in the diplomatic, and in the, the, the legal world. So this is the fight, and uh, our objectives are very clear, and I believe we do have the tools. We do have the tools, and we can develop more tools. And again, here the Foreign Office is uh, for you, for us, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate what you do. Uh, we want to thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, lunchtime when we can uh, listen more to your take, to your impressions, to your ideas. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nani. Uh, as I mentioned, and thank you for the uh, people of the press. Uh, from now on, it will be an internal discussion. Thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, talking about press, uh, one of the, I don't have to tell you that one of the main arenas in which we are uh, fighting and uh, where the conflict is, is uh, going on is